Now, about 40% of Americans will be diagnosed with a type of cancer at some point in their lives. It's an alarming statistic, made even more so by the fact that cancer research itself is under threat in the United States, with the Trump administration continuing to slash millions of dollars in vital funding and leaving countless families scrambling for options. Staff writer for The New York Times Magazine, Jonathan Mahler, is investigating just what kind of impact these cuts are already having across the country. He joins Hari Srinivasan to discuss discuss his findings. Christian, thanks. Jonathan Mahler, thanks so much for joining us. You wrote a piece in the New York Times Magazine recently, and it's titled, Trump is shutting down the war on cancer. And you take so many different approaches in this piece. Let's, I guess, start with the first. What do you mean by this? Um, give me the scale of the war on cancer and what he's shutting down. Yeah. So, I mean, the war on cancer is is something that we started, um, launched in this country, you know, back in 1971, President Nixon actually signed the legislation, the National Cancer Act. And really what it was, was a commitment to make a sustained, large investment in treating cancer and improving our treatment of cancer. And over the decades, uh, that investment has grown steadily. And um, now we've reached at a, a moment where, where you know, we're poised for, for even greater breakthroughs uh, at the very moment that the Trump administration has decided that um, we're spending, apparently decided that we're spending way too much money uh, trying to cure cancer. And yeah. uh, the, the, you know, the war on the war on cancer, it's happening both in terms of the cancellation of individual grants, so individual uh, projects that were, you know, dedicated to to, to discovering kind of new new treatments, um, or or you know, kind of um, adapting new treatments. Uh, it's happening uh, in terms of of uh, freezes in funding to research universities that depend on NIH money to keep their labs running. Uh, are suddenly finding that money frozen, not appearing, uh, and then it's happening in an in an uh, on a kind of a larger even larger scale. Uh, and this is something that's still a little bit, you know, to be determined. But the president's proposed budget for next year, which is, you know, still still before Congress, is calling for a 38 percent cut to our cancer research budget, which is, you know, three billion dollars. I mean, it is this is a lot of money. Uh, in addition to that, the administration is is trying to lower the the reimbursement rate that research universities get for their overhead expenses. So, you know, universities that are conducting this research, uh, they they have scientists who are doing the work, but they also have to keep the labs running. They have to, um, you know, employ people to to um, you know to 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 administer the grants. Uh, they have to pay for the electricity, et cetera. Uh, they're they're um, able to 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 expense some of those costs and the the administration wants to dramatically lower the the reimbursement rate for universities so it's really a, a kind of a 360 degree um attack on on uh, on this funding system give me an idea or give our audience uh some perspective here and, and set the level okay this has been happening for decades how successful has that war been i mean you know we're spending billions and billions of dollars every year i get that but like, is there a way that you can measure what a dollar gets us? Yeah. So, I mean, my favorite statistic is, uh, which which was um, published recently in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, is that about every $300 that the government spends on cancer research extends someone's life by one year. So... Uh, that feels like a pretty modest <laughs> investment to me as uh, um, you know as someone who who lost his mom to cancer um, seems to me you know pretty worth it um, to say nothing of the fact that there are enormous economic benefits to this investment too I mean uh, the the um, the the biotechnology industry the pharmaceutical industry all of these and and all the investors in these companies have all made an enormous amount of money off of uh, off of the the research that began on this basic biological level funded by our government. And so when somebody gets a cancer today versus perhaps our parents' generation, what is the likely outcome? Are we more likely to survive it? Are there fewer cancers that are kind of untreatable? 
our ability to treat cancer has been you know, dramatically transformed, particularly since the 1990s. So really, if you, you think about how this, this whole war on cancer has unfolded, the first you know, 20 plus years were, were really a period where scientists were mostly grappling with how how much more complicated this disease was than they than they had realized um it's it's not a single disease it's it's hundreds of thousands of diseases uh, and each one behaves differently in everyone's on every organ and in everyone's body and really beginning in the late 90s you know what what had been um basically the only options historically had been you know surgery really uh, and then you know chemotherapy came along and radi radiation as well but these were you know all uh, ra both radiation and chemotherapy are enormously toxic uh, and and you know not always effective but what what the, the really the biggest innovation and and the innovation that we're still really scientists are still really building on uh, is what's known as immunotherapy and immunotherapy is essentially um, the 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 use of one's immune system to, to the stimulation of, of an immune system to detect the mutant cancer cells and fight the cells itself. So your immune system does the work that otherwise these toxic chemotherapy chemicals would be doing, uh, which people tolerate much better, so their quality of life during treatment is much better, and it's also much more effective. So this is a new, you know, immunotherapy is, is, is relatively new. We're talking about, you know, 15, 15 years or so. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and there's still a lot of cancers where, uh, where they're just beginning to, to, to understand how to use immunotherapy. To illustrate what's happening kind of in the research ecosystem, you help kind of personalize it by looking at uh, Rachel Siriani, a professor at the University of Massachusetts, her research focuses on an aggressive form of pediatric cancer known as medulloblastoma. Tell us her story and how it's indicative of what's happening to other researchers, people who are facing grants. She's working on basically a new way to deliver a drug, to deliver drugs into the interior of the brain to attack this very aggressive form of pediatric brain cancer, which you know kills hundreds of kids every year, um, uh, medulloblastoma, and um, so she's been working kind of steadily on this for for you know ten years now, and um, she's she she had uh, uh, three NIH grants to do this work, was making great progress. Her grants uh, were just because they you know they only last for for five years or so, were coming up in two thousand twenty five and 2026. So coming into this new year um, and the new presidential administration, she was aware that she needed new grants to keep her research going. You know, she runs a lab of, of with, with seven researchers and technicians, and it's expensive and, and time consuming work running, you know, running all these studies. So she had submitted uh, two grant applications to keep her work going to the NIH. And um, uh, days after uh, the, the inauguration, uh, she was informed that the meetings where her grants were going to be considered uh, had, had been canceled. And so um, months now went by. She had to start laying people off in her, in her lab. Um, she had to cancel uh, one of her most promising studies. And then she was informed that they, they in, in June, that they, they were not, that neither project was going to be funded. So now she's, she's faced with this, this decision of, well, you know, what am I going to do? I've been, this is, this is this important work that I'm devoted to that I've been doing for years now, and I'm making great progress. And she's come to this decision now that, that she, for the moment, at least she can't really focus on this work any longer because pediatric brain cancer work is very expensive. It's expensive because uh, it requires a very specific kind of lab mouse. So now she's she's decided she's going to have to just pivot away from it and start working in, in some other fields, you know, which is obviously, you know, tragic. I mean, this was a woman who was making great strides in 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 helping children with brain cancer survive. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, it's hard to imagine, oh, you know, some something more worthy to, to for our government to be investing in um and yet you know here she is having to having to um, move to other fields so you know we're in a period now where you said that in the mid 70s america's five-year cancer survival rate sat at 49 percent today it's 68 percent that's startling considering how relatively new immunotherapy is and perhaps some of the work that's happening with mRNA research that could impact cancer. Is this a productive time for cancer research? Many people whom I spoke with said that this is, this is one of the most 
productive moments, if not the most productive moment in the history of cancer research, because we have all of that accumulated knowledge. We have all of this new technology. We have artificial intelligence. There is there is so much so many sort of forces coming together. There is, as you say, there, there are cancer vaccines, mRNA vaccines and other cancer vaccines being developed. There are new studies now uh, to detect a cancer in in the bloodstream uh, years before 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 you have any symptoms. So so the ability to, to begin to treat cancer before it even appears. Um, there there's a new radiation treatment uh, in development. It's a flash of radiation that's literally a microsecond, uh, and that's it. And so rather than a prolonged radiation treatment, which causes all sorts of damage to the surrounding tissue, it just hits the 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 spot and and just in an instant. Uh, and you're done. Um, so, and and as I was was telling you before, immunotherapy is this incredibly promising area. So there is there is um, there's so much going on right now. Um, it's a it's a you know, really exciting time for cancer research, but of course, it's also a terrifying time for cancer researchers. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the politics and the motivation of um, the president's cuts on this. I mean, even you know, as you describe, if the NIH stopped taking meetings well before kind of Doge came in. This seems like part of a sort of an orchestrated plan on what to do. This was a, a very deliberate and premeditated campaign. And um, it's not an easy thing to do because the NIH and the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, which is you know part of the NIH, which kind of oversees a lot of the cancer research in this country, they were they were built to be insulated from politics for for obvious reasons. So so if you wanted to make, you know, a sort of politically motivated assault on on these institutions, you, you know, it was going to require some forethought. And 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 that's 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 what happened. I mean, this administration came in and and they knew exactly what to do uh, and how they were going to do it. And um it, and and they they started freezing grants. I mean, it's it's it you know, it's un, it's unprecedented for active research grants to be to be uh, canceled. I mean, truly unprecedented. And, um, you know, and, and it was happening by, you know, by the hundreds. Uh, it's unprecedented for, for universities to have their funding frozen. So this administration, they knew how to disrupt this system, and they did. And what's puzzling to me is still is, you know, you can explain this, I think, as, okay, this is part of the war on on government bureaucracy. Um, on what they would say is government argue is government waste. This is part of the war on uh, research universities that they feel are are um, you know too progressive, too 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 left. Um, this is you know also important to say. This is part of 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 a kind of attack on the scientific establishment, which of course has uh, you know lost a lot of uh, a lot of its cred credibility in many quarters during during the COVID pandemic. I get that, but what's your plan? What, what are you going to once you've once you've canceled all these grants, once you've cut all this funding, what, what are you going to do? I mean, are we are, are we just going to concede the fact that we are going to, uh, you know, essentially surrender the war on cancer? I mean, or or is there a plan uh, that you just haven't told the American people about to to build something in its place? And um, I, unfortunately, I haven't seen any evidence of a, of a plan. You have a statement from the Office of Management Budget. Uh, it says, efforts to focus NIH spending will establish a more sustainable and accountable fiscal path for NIH while ensuring that resources are managed effectively and in a manner that best supports America's biomedical research enterprise. You lay out kind of one of the critiques by uh, Joe Lonsdale, uh, a supporter of uh, Elon Musk and the president. And he says, look, this is a, a, a system that's grown bloated and bureaucratic and it's not working nearly as fast as it could and you know they want to change things so what's the problem with that critique it is very important to recognize that this is not a perfect system by any means there are, there are, there are criticisms of it both on the left and the right any bureaucratic system that has been evolving for for you know more than 50 years now it is it has gotten big it has gotten unwieldy uh, it has gotten um, risk averse uh, there are too many older scientists who are blocking too many younger scientists who have who have, um, you know, kind of more more potentially um, game changing ideas. 
um, who are more familiar with, with new technology, et cetera, um, that are not able to kind of enter the field. And scientists are spending too much of their time writing grant proposals because it's gotten so competitive. That's a problem. They should be in the lab. They shouldn't be spending all their hours you know, writing 120 page proposals for a grant. So um, that is all true. Um, and and Joe Lonsdale is, is correct about that. Um, I think the problem is that this, this idea that you can um, just sort of disrupt this system, uh, like you would, uh, um, you know, disrupt uh, the the technology industry, um, you know, and replace it with with startup companies. That that's not how scientific research works. It's one scientist in one lab making a, a a small discovery that another that and publishing it in a paper, and another scientist reading that paper and seeing, oh, that's interesting. Um, I think I might be able to like add a, add a add a twist to that. I might be able to to advance that idea a little further. It's it's sort of it's collaborative. It's incremental. It's very different. Than, than how the the Silicon Valley functions. So um, so I would say that you know I think his his criticisms of of the system are are, are legitimate. I think uh, the idea that it could be replaced by some sort of um, you know disruption centered Silicon Valley style um, approach is uh, seems seems misguided to me. To say nothing of the fact that as I mentioned before. We haven't seen any any proposal for for, um, for 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 what's coming next. Are people today suffering from the cuts that are coming to cancer research? So there are isolated examples of of that happening. The chief of surgery at the National Cancer Institute, who's running a clinical trial now to treat a particular form of cancer with immunotherapy, a form that a form of cancer that has not yet been successfully treated with immunotherapy, and he uh, two of his technicians who who build who manufacture the cells he needs to to inject in his patients to treat them, um, and these are late stage cancer patients, these two technicians uh, were laid off. So, so that delayed the treatment of his patients, delayed his clinical trials. So, so, so yes. Um, the bigger issue though, is um, the way, you know, the way this system is structured, the, the government funds the early stage research that no uh, no pharmaceutical company or biotechnology company is is going to invest in because it's it's a it's experimental it's it's a, it's sort of basic it's foundational when it's investigative then you get patents then you get biotechnology companies then you get private investment what we're seeing now is will ultimately result in a slowing of that survival rate because because progress at this early stage is what leads to the 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 great breakthroughs in treatments, um, the the great successful clinical trials in humans. But if you take away that foundational research that only the government will pay for, no no private industry doesn't want to pay for it because it's 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 too um, speculative. And we're seeing this system kind of being being attacked at this very you know foundational level and we won't really know the effects of it for for see the effects of it for for years to come staff writer at the new york times magazine jonathan Mahler, thanks so much for joining us my pleasure thanks for having me